Hi, I'm Professor Seth Chandler, and this is Analytic Methods for Lawyers. This is an asynchronous course being offered through the University of Houston Law Center. The purpose of this video is to provide some organization for students who are actually enrolled in the course. As all of the videos for the course are going to be posted on YouTube, including this one, there may be people not enrolled in the course who run into this video. Probably this video is not going to be particularly helpful for them. It's intended primarily for students who are actually enrolled in the class. Also, this is probably about the last you're going to see of me in the videos for the class. Maybe I'll make an appearance at some point or other, but in general you're simply going to be seeing a screen capture, but I did want to include myself in this video so that you knew that I wasn't a really clever AI or some kind of uh, other bot. All right. Um, with that background, let's actually get rolling here. And we've got a syllabus for this course. It can be found on this Google Drive web uh, site. Here's what the syllabus looks like. And you'll see it's got, um, this is the current draft as I'm writing this. It has a day-by-day or, and video by video chart. There are multiple videos for one day. We have the learning objectives for the class, various policies for students enrolled in the class, including when quizzes will be, office hours, and the like. We have the grading scheme for the course. We have, I'm required by university policy to include a notice on counseling. And let me just add that this would also extend to any issues uh, created by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this is being recorded in January of 2021, and unfortunately the pandemic is raging both in the United States and here in Houston. And finally, there's a discussion of some ideas for projects which are part of the course. So here's one uh, piece of uh, information for the course that's located on Google Drive. As we'll discuss, most of the remainder of the course information is going to be in the Wolfram Cloud to which you will get an account. Okay. All right. And in fact, um, the first thing you're going to want to do for uh, this course, and I would urge you to do it before the start of the semester if you possibly can, is to go to this URL here. We'll click on that. And you're going to see this is a recipe for students at the University of Houston on how to um, get Mathematica Desktop, Mathematica Online. If you want it, apparently you can get Wolfram Alpha Pro. I've got nothing against that. Might be useful, but I, I don't intend to emphasize that particular interface in this course. It's going to go through for students what to do about that. Probably the most important thing is if you are having trouble with this, um, you could try IT or university IT, but if that doesn't work, please contact me at my email address. Let me know because if you're having issues, others are having issues as well. And I want this to be a, a pleasant out of box experience. There's nothing more frustrating than having difficulties and just getting started. So what you're going to want ultimately is a general Wolfram research account. You're going to want the Mathematica desktop software. That's what I'm actually running right now. You're seeing an example of it here. And you're going to want a Mathematica online account. There's a video, a couple of videos down the line, where I'm going to go through how to use the Wolfram Cloud. You should make sure, uh, I'm sure the online version is running 12.2. You should make sure the desktop version is running 12.2. It won't be a catastrophe if it's running 12.1.1, which was the prior version, but I'd like to make sure that you're fully up to date. Course notebooks, which are the primary reading material for this course, are located in the Wolfram Cloud. That's one of the reasons you need a Wolfram Cloud account. Here's the URL you need. I also make this shorter version. And basically, these notebooks are what are called computational essays. They're a mixture of commentary and code. The code is annotated. They should have consistent uh, formatting. You can view the notebooks within the cloud. You can move them to your own cloud account and run them there or edit them there. 
You can download them to Desktop Mathematica and run and edit them there. But those, that's kind of like your casebook for this course. In fact, here's what it'll look like uh, if all goes well. Um, you don't need to see my to-do list. We'll move that away. Um, but here are a bunch of the notebooks that have been prepared so far, and they're just sitting here. You can view them as a, a list if you prefer. Anyway, there's a whole separate video on how to navigate the cloud, but that's what you got. All right, back to business. And let's actually talk about the videos. Uh, if you're listening to me, you know that there are videos for this course, and every notebook has a video. Um, there's a playlist on my YouTube channel called Analytic Methods for Lawyers 2021. Uh, here's the URL that you can go to find it, and um, this is what you're likely... This may just be what I see rather than what you see, but anyway, you can see that there are a bunch of videos that are available for you to watch. The videos, if you look here, they do have the sequence number that corresponds to the 2021 numbering system. Okay. So, um, my suggestion, as I said, is that you have the notebook open, you watch the video, you pause the video, you see what's going on with the notebook, you play with it. You could just watch the video straight through, read the notebook straight through, and there the twain shall meet. But um, I don't think that's the best way to do it. And um, I fully anticipate that you are not going to be able to watch a 30-minute or hour-long, there are a few that are an hour-long video. Just pause it, then take a break, come back to it, get some coffee. Uh, or and, and if you know the material and you've seen it before, that's why YouTube has 2x. Just zip through it. When it gets really dense, slow it down. So use YouTube as, as a good medium for instruction. I find it to be a very helpful medium, and I hope that you do as well. Exercises. Uh, every video and notebook has a corresponding set of exercises. They are posted in the Wolfram Cloud. Let's talk exercise. Uh, each video and notebook collectively has a corresponding set of exercises. So for lecture number five, there's exercises number five. There's a no answers version of the exercise. They're in the Wolfram Cloud, and they're at this URL here. Some of the exercises are, are short. Others, particularly at the beginning of the course, are longer. There's no requirement you do the exercises. You don't want to do them? Don't do them. I will say if you don't do them, I think you're going to struggle on the quizzes, but that's your choice. Uh, I think if you do the exercises, you're going to find that the quizzes follow them fairly well. Supposing you want the answers to the exercises, they're also posted in a separate folder it's got the same name, it's just in a different folder. Um, I would suggest you struggle a little bit with those questions before peeking at the answers. Peeking at the answers is good when you get stuck. It's not so good before you get stuck. Also, I'm not going to provide every possible way to answer the question. Uh, if you're not sure if you, your answer is any good, uh, you could see whether it gets the same. When you evaluate your code, does it get the same result as I do? And also, is your uh, code as short? as mine. Those are two good guides for idiomatic Wolfram language programming. Readings. This course is not super heavy on readings, but there are some and they're important. I'm going to put them in the syllabus and they'll either be in the Wolfram Cloud in the other materials folder. I'm going to get you a, a link to that at some later date. Or there may be some materials that for whatever reason don't belong in the Wolfram Cloud and um, I will give you either the URL to that so that you just go to the web, or if need be, I guess I'll stick them in Blackboard or email them to you or something like that. But generally, I'll either give you the URL and you can find them yourself, or for some things, I'll stick them in the cloud. Also, um, I think a lot of learning is self-learning, uh, and uh, I anticipate that there may be a few things I cover in this course where the readings and my lectures 
could possibly be imperfect. Um, it's totally fine to be looking at other materials. I don't consider that a bad thing at all. Um, here are some resources that I like to use. There's the towardsdatascience.com. It's almost like a magazine, a web magazine. It has excellent stuff that's actually tended to explain things. It's not heavy on notation. It may use programming. There seem to be a lot of Python fans there, which is fine. Um, but I use it, and I would recommend it as well. For really state-of-the-art visual explanations, I would go to Grant Sanderson's Three Blue, One Brown YouTube channel. He doesn't cover a huge amount of material, but if he has something on the subject, like, you know, how really does a neural network work, his stuff is fantastic. Uh, Khan Academy, I'm sure you've all encountered Khan Academy at some point in your career. They don't cover a lot of what I cover in this course, but they do cover statistics, and they do a good job with it as they do with everything else. So if you're confused on uh, you know, what linear regression is, you can go to Khan Academy and find other stuff. StatQuest, this is Josh Starmer's um, project. It is both corny and well done. Uh, he tends to focus on statistics and machine learning. And as he says, his goal is to provide a clear explanation. He's not heavy on details, but he is heavy on clarity. And so if you need a big picture look at things, I like the Josh Starmer StatQuest um, site. Two Minute Papers with Dr. Carlo Joli Fahir is a site, it's, it's good for getting project ideas or just learning about this area. His focus is on machine learning with a heavy emphasis on visualization and materials. It's a, he always has, I think it's almost always fun uh, to see his stuff. And so if you want to get excited about what's going on today in machine learning and see how fast the field is evolving, good place to go. Andrew Eng, he's really a, a pioneer, but pioneers are five years old at this point. He had a, his machine learning course at Berkeley. It's still really, really good. The only thing I would say is that some of the techniques he covers are slightly out of fashion or the field has advanced, but still really good material to look at. Finally, if you want to learn about um, the Wolfram language, there's a ton of resources. Please come to me if you're curious in that area and I can point you to lots more. But sort of for what's currently going on, there's the Wolfram Research blog, and then Stephen Wolfram is the brainchild behind Wolfram Research. There's a reason they share the name. Um, and he has his own personal blog, a lot of which is about physics, um, which you may or may not find interesting, but he also discusses uses of Wolfram language. Finally, one channel that you might run across, it was popular, still has a number of subscribers. It's run by a guy named Suraj Raval, and all I can say is it's a rather sad story. I don't recommend the channel. Um, grading, I just want to be make sure you understand how grading works. There are six quizzes, and then there is a final and or a project. You can do one or the other. You can do a final, you can do a project or you can do both. What I'm going to do is take the highest of your score on those two things and that'll be your score. So if you want to focus on the project and you don't want to do the final, that's great. If you want to do the final and you don't want to do the project, that's fine. Uh, you can do them both. I'm not going to punish you for doing them both, but it might lead you to dilute your uh, scarce time. Either way, you'll get the higher of your scores on those two things and you can look at the rubric on the uh, Google Drive spreadsheet to see how it works out. Finally, make sure May 11th is set aside. I'm gonna be holding the exam on that date. There will likely be a one of these things where I give you a window of time in which to start and begin the exam, but you won't have the entire window to actually work on the exam. Um, the project, it's gonna to need to be a, the topic and methodology needs to be approved by me in advance. One of the best things about this course is you get to work with me on a project if you choose to do so. I think that should be a very rewarding activity. Uh, the form of it's gonna be a computational essay. 
or it could be a 3,500 word traditional document. I would prefer, unless you've got some good reason, to make it a computational essay. And what can it cover? It can discuss how some form of computation studied in this course could illuminate either a legal problem or you can explore a data set relevant to law or something else that I approve that seems to have something to do with analytic methods for law. Um, let me say a word about uh, the workload in this course. It's not light, um, and I've got a purpose here. That is, I'm teaching you both material and a computer language in an integrated fashion. The reason I'm doing that is it's my belief you can learn it way better and you can learn considerably more that way. Um, what that means, though, is you got to learn the at least a little bit of the computer language first. And getting up the Wolfram language uh, slope is a difficult process. I'm not going to kid you. Um, and you do have a fairly front-loaded syllabus here. That is, if you look at what you're going to be doing for the next two weeks, it's heavy. Okay. The, the, the good news is that you don't have a final that counts for 100%. My intent is not to brutalize you with a final exam. And so this of course is a little bit sort of the reverse of the typical law school pattern, which tends to get heavier and heavier as the semester works on. But my thought here is we're going to try to avoid passive learning. We're going to work on activity with exercises, hopefully for many of you with the project. And I really know from past experience that this is going to work out. Um, finally, I'll just tell you, you know, this is an asynchronous course. You do it at your own pace. The only uh, things are sort of by the time the quiz days come and those are marked on the syllabus, you need to know the material that's going to be covered on the quizzes so you can't indefinitely procrastinate until May. Um, finally, I've discussed the project. Um, the virtues of the project are I, th I know you will learn a lot. And it gives you something you can show to other people. That is, you, you're not going to show your final exam in uh, secured transactions to your uh, person who's trying to give you a job. But you might well want to show them the really interesting project that you did uh, looking at the bar examination data or whatever it was. Fin Finally, although this course is asynchronous, it is not intended as a course in which you have no contact with the professor. I will have office hours twice a week at regularly scheduled times. Plus, if those times are inconvenient or, you know, something you realize something on Friday or on Monday or maybe even over a weekend, after all, very few of us have anything to do during this dreadful time of the pandemic, send me an email, send me, you know, a couple of 30-minute slots when you are available and I'll try and make myself available for you and others. Um, one of the things I want is for this course to be fun for you. I don't want you to feel frustrated, and I know that there are going to be times when the material is just overwhelming or difficult. Don't be afraid. Just come talk to me. I will, I'm pretty patient at working things through with students, and I'm pretty good at clarifying misconceptions and misunderstandings. So as, as issues arise, you're paying money for this course, unlike just the people who are watching it on YouTube. Um, take advantage of that and uh, don't let this be an anonymous course, just let it be asynchronous. Finally, um, I need, will likely need to send emails to you periodically during the course. Uh, things are going to evolve. There may be areas where I'm seeing problems. There may be areas which I think we need to spend more time on, less time on as we proceed. And so I'm not going to you know, defeat your reliance interest in having studied certain materials already, but I can foresee occasions on which I make adjustments to the future curriculum. So that's it for course organization. I really do want this to be an enjoyable course for you. Uh, please stay in contact and enjoy analytic methods for lawyers.